Welcome, everyone. Um, this is uh, my name is Lisa Armstrong, and I'm here to join the Marxist classes. And I'm teaching the class called Class Struggle and Feminism in the USA. So, um, let's see. so today, um, I'll give a quick overview of what we'll be talking about. We're going to be looking at the Marxist analyses on the woman's question. Um, and this is what it was called in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and we'll look at it across the century and come to the present, of course. We'll look at socialist thinkers and activists who championed working class women's rights and developed a Marxist analysis on women's issues. And we'll discuss working class women's issues and conditions in the United States today. And here, um, the term that I'm using, um, I already earmarked that in the late 19th and early 20th century, it was singular, the woman's question. Um, in the case of today, we are, um, the term women, ha we generally use it in a more expansive way. So this includes trans women, um, gender queer, as well as feminine presenting, people and it's a way for us to keep an eye on the marginalization on the basis of sex and gender. So just a little bit of room to think about the nomenclature, how we're talking about these issues currently and the ways that we're thinking about our analyses today as well as in the past. So I want to start with the first question. Now this question we're not going to talk about right away, but what I'm hoping you can do is hopefully you have either a piece of paper and a pen or you have a, a electronic device that you can start keeping notes um, and note down your answers. So I will be speaking, I will be giving my presentation, but if issues come up, um, come to your mind, uh, write them down and we will come back to this question. Um, so my question to start us out with, just to keep us thinking and ready for the discussion that will come after my, the main part of my presentation, is what are working class women's issues today in the United States? Okay, so as we've heard from speakers over the course of these classes, um, Marxist theory is, is very specific. Dialectical materialism seeks to understand the world it also seeks to transform the world. Uh, Marxist theory has as a central analytic process of Marxism is this duality of seeking to understand the world and seeking to transform the world. They are in dialectical relation to each other. And third, as a field of analysis, Marxism develops from political praxis. That is, it develops from where theory meets practice, meets politics in its time and place. So as good dialectical thinkers, there isn't a theory that somehow transcends history. It's always embedded in the world in which we live, the place in which we live, the time in which we live. It's not broken off from history, it's connected to history, but we can't think of these concepts outside of our time and place. Okay, so I'm starting a ways back this is the picture of Clara Zetkin, and the article I connected with this class was from 1898, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. It was a speech that Clara Zetkin gave at the um, Social Democratic Party in Germany, their convention. It was held in 1896 in Gotha, and this speech outlined an argument, a Marxist analysis on the woman question that has become a cornerstone to the way that we think about the praxis on these issues. So this is a picture of Clara Zetkins, who's on the left of the screen, and Rosa Luxemburg in Copenhagen at a slightly different time, a little bit later, um, in 1910. All right, so Clara Zetkin, born in 1857, she died in 1933. And she has a quote that I thought I would start us with on the woman's question. Um, and here I've put it as the woman's question. Really, at the time, it was the woman question. And she says, as far as the proletarian woman is concerned, it is capitalism's need to exploit and to search incessantly for a cheap labor force that has created the woman's question, the woman question. 
So this speech that she gave was in 1896, as I already mentioned, and it was at a time when the Social Democratic Party in Germany was trying to figure out how to build a more unified working class, how to build um, among the masses of people. Um, and Clara Zetkin was making an argument that was a, um, a complicated one at the time, because at this same period, the rise of the demand for women's right to the franchise, to the vote, was absolutely a hot question. And it was a hot question within um, the SPD, within the Social Democratic Party of Germany. And the question was, is the right to vote, this question that was called a feminist question at its time, is this a revolutionary desire? Is this a revolutionary demand? Um, is this demand by feminists something that working class women need? Um, and we should fight for as a movement. Clara Zetkin in this speech clearly, and other locations, but in this speech, she clearly outlines the argument for why um, revolutionary parties must join with feminists on the question of women's right to vote, the women's right to the franchise, because it creates greater unity for a working class mass movement. And her argument, and we'll come, we'll end with this, but I can tell you right at the beginning, many of you probably already know, her argument was absolutely, this is not enough. It is not the end point. This is an absolutely critical demand right here at the turn of the 20th century in 1898, she's speaking. This is a critical demand, not because it will solve the problems of proletarian women, what she called working class women, but because it is one more tool. It is a tool to build that democratic civic representation through this use of the vote. And she rightly said, you know, proletarian men have the right to vote and it hasn't changed the conditions of their exploitation as workers in capitalism, but it is one of the tools to build the, a stronger movement, to build that additional whole aspect of the movement that pulls women into um, active political organization. Okay, so um, I wanted to give you um, a sense of, of the breadth of these questions um, that we're asking here, that this is absolutely central to the founding of communist movements around the world. Um, and this is a photograph of Nasiya Hanim. She was a Turkish delegate at the Congress People of the East um, in Baku, it was held in 1920. And um, she spoke, you can see in the audience that many of the, if not most, there were seven women delegates to the Congress of the People of the East and, and Nasiya Hanim was one of them. And um, she spoke to demand the rights of women. Um, and I thought it would be worth seeing, first of all, the distinction that she makes as a proletariat woman, as a working class woman who was part of this um, building communist movement. So what Nasiya Hanim said is, the women's movement in the East must not be looked at from the standpoint of those frivolous feminists, so you can hear already that tension, um, who are content to see women's place in social life as that of a delicate plant or an elegant doll. So she's making a distinction here. She's not letting go of the women's movement, particularly the working class women's movement, the proletariat women's uh, movement, but she's saying this isn't about some kind of fragility or a protection of property rights um, or giving property rights to women. In fact, it's, it's something quite different. And as we look at the demands that were that came out of the 1920 Baku conference around women's rights, um, complete equality of rights, those civic rights, including the right to vote, but much more than that, um, ensuring to women unconditional access to educational and vocational institutions that were established for men, so the right to education, um, particularly to the right to skilled um, occupations, as well as right to um, a wage work itself. Um, the equality of rights of both parties in marriage. So this in 1920 was absolutely a radical demand that both parties to marriage had access to the same um, um, ability to divorce, um, to have custody of children, to make questions of bodily autonomy, um, to have the right to, um, to live without violence, right? So these equality of rights in both parties in marriage was 
central to the demands in 1920 from this, from this conference. Um, the unconditional abolition of polygamy was one of their demands. Um, unconditional admission of women to employment in legislative and administrative institutions. Um, and the establishment of committees for the rights and protection of women everywhere in cities, in towns, in villages. And here again, you can hear that working class women and probably also rural peasant women's rights. Um, this is a location where the organization of peasant women, of agricultural women, um, was equally important um, for the social movement. It was not simply those women living in cities who had waged work, it was also the women living in rural areas who, who made their living by, um, by farming. Okay, so just to remind ourselves of, again, that, that point of time and place. Um, so these were, this kind of clarity about what are working class women's rights um, was from the absolute beginnings of um, Marxist movements for, um, for socialism. So um, today we're going to go through uh, the basics of Marxist praxis on the women's question, as I had mentioned, um, and look at these three questions that are central to what we do. How to build a revolutionary movement, how to organize everyone who's integral to a revolutionary movement, and how to make life revolutionary. And we'll do it schematically, but I'm hoping this will give us a chance to elaborate and to, to think in more detail for our time and place. So how to build a revolutionary movement. Marx's question in his writings, um, he had many questions. He was looking, trying to figure out how capitalism works. Um, but one of his key questions and the question that we benefit from his, his careful thought about is who is integral to a revolutionary movement. Um, and his answer was the oppressed and exploited masses of people. His question was also, why are the masses of people central to a revolutionary movement? His answer because capitalism feeds and reproduces itself, sustains itself from harnessing, that is the, 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 the extraction of surplus value, from harnessing the labor of the many. So for the very reason that capitalism requires the exploitation of the masses, that's absolutely why the masses of people are central to a revolutionary movement. So how to build a revolutionary movement? And here in the question of, of, of the woman's question, um, Engels' question is how do we build a revolutionary movement? And his answer was organize everyone who is exploited and oppressed. This is absolutely dovetailing with the previous slide um, with Marx's answers. So Engels in the origin of the family, private property in the state, he had demands for unfettered freedom and rights for women, for the abolishment, this was a horrifying demand at the time when the, when the book was published, abolish the family. As, and in his argument, it was a location of servitude. It was a location where women did not have the rights, were in fact, um, through what he called father right or patriarchy, were not able to access the, um, any kinds of rights or um, basic autonomy that was central to joining the movement, uh, the revolutionary movement, and abolish women's social and familial servitude as a result. Okay, so I'm gonna take a quick moment here. We're gonna look at Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and the, her work. Um, so Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is, was born in 1890. She died in 1964. She was a communist party member from 1937 until she died in 1964. Um, in February 13th, it's right in the same period, um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn addresses in this picture the Patterson, New Jersey um, silk, silk mill workers. She addressed 24,000 on this day. Um, and silk mill workers was a deeply um, gender uh, open uh, uh, industry. So there were many, many women mill workers as well as men in this factory. Um, and so there was a whole series of these silk mill factories in Patterson, New Jersey. So she was arrested for this speech in 1913. 
And within days, um, the workers across the 300 mills in the region joined the struggle and it increased to 75,000 workers. So some people say this was the first mass strike um, in the US, that it, it's, it's one of the arguments. Um, it certainly was industry-wide. So there was a way that this wasn't about one factory or one owner of the factory. It was about the silk mill industry at large and that kind of solidarity that her speech inspired as well as the struggles of the workers themselves. So from her speech that day, I have a small quotation here. It is neither sympathy nor justice that makes an appeal to the employer, but it is power. If a committee can go to the employer with this ultimatum, we represent all the men and women in this shop. They are organized in a union as you are organized in a manufacturer's association. They have met and formulated in that union a demand for better hours and wages, and they are not going to work one day longer unless they get it. So what we can see in this speech in 1913 is the absolute centrality of organizing everyone that it is not a question of organizing only the men into a union. In fact, there's no chance of success unless it's men and women in industry, men and women who live under the foot, the boot of capitalism for the organizing to succeed. So if we go back to Marx and Engels and that argument about how do we build a revolutionary movement, at the heart of Marxist praxis on the woman question was, how do we make sure that women are part of this movement? Not simply an adjunct to the movement or an aspect, um, a fragment, but they have to be at the very heart of revolutionary movements. And the, the building of a socialist, of a mass movement requires that level of concentration. So it may seem like a basic point, but in fact, it required overcoming a whole range of resistances should women be in public? Now, if we look at this photograph, Elizabeth Gurley uh, Flynn is standing on some kind of a platform and she's leaning over and you can see the American flag on the start on the side and probably a woman worker sitting on the side of that stand. She's out in public as a young woman, um, well, in her 20s, a woman, um, giving a public speech. This was not acceptable behavior for women. Um, not for working class women, not for women, uh, middle class women, not for elite women. This was not a, a typical um, location to find women. So part of her very life, that refusal to stay silent, that refusal to stay privatized within the family, that demand that she takes that stage and gives these agitational speeches to build unity, to join together people, to overcome these kinds of sexist assumptions of where is a woman's place. So what her life shows is a woman's place is, as we say today, in the union. So here we have the struggles that they were part of. Even those obvious statements by, um, and those obvious outcomes of a Marxist praxis on the woman's question were struggles within the movement and then that to make sure that women had a public place, women were allowed to join unions. We fought for the right for women's right to the franchise, to the vote. So even those basic demands for equal rights was a matter of persuading people within the women's movement. And that's part of the importance of Clara Zetkin's speech as well. She's persuading her comrades in the SPD, in the Socialist Democratic Party in Germany, she's persuading them to pay attention to women workers, to working class women. So women workers in Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's speech, it's quite clear that you can't win a union struggle without organizing women workers. That's clear. If you only organize a fraction of these workers, you will not win the strike. You will not have a chance of winning the strike. Okay. All right. So as part of this argument, um, as I've gone over already of how to organize everyone, Zetkin's question was another one. Why aren't there more working class and peasant women in revolutionary organizations and movements? And this is a question that we continue to ask. 
where are the women? Where we have to organize everyone, we know this, we have to do that kind of outreach so that the, the whole of the working class joins together, joins a, a, a socialist movement, a mass movement, a union movement, these, these movements of the working class. Um, but where are they? Why aren't they here? And her question was quite serious. Her answer was one that demanded some changes within uh, the organizations that were seeking to organize women. So she said, revolutionary movements, and this could be union movements, these could be civic movements, uh, these could be the Social Democratic Party in Germany, revolutionary movements must foster the conditions for working class and peasant women to join and lead. So it's, it's part of this is outreach, part of this is making the conditions of the meetings possible. What time are they at? Are there other duties that women have to attend to? Um, what kinds of dangers are different for women and men? We already spoke about the difficulty of being in public at this time, the kind of um, stigma attached to publicness for women, even working class women who were taking jobs outside, not solely confined to the home. Um, but also, what does it mean to be welcome in a movement? What does it mean to have the doors truly opened rather than grudgingly allowed in? Perhaps it means time to speak at a meeting or the capacity to lead initiative, the willingness to listen. All of these things are small, but are critical to organizing everybody. So in the speech that we, I asked folks to look at before today, um, I'm, whether or not you did, it's absolutely okay because we're going to go over it. Um, Zetkin, in this speech, only in conjunction, she puts the point in the speech title, I love that, only in conjunction with the proletarian woman will socialism be victorious. So here she reminds the, the revolutionary people the, of the SPD in 1898, you're not going to win without proletarian women. Working class women are at the heart of what we're doing. So she starts outlining um, in this speech some of the things that confine, that make women different, um, even working class women, even working class women who are waged workers, who are in factories like the silk mills in Patterson. As a social grouping, women are segregated from public life. Women's labor, has two qualities, two capacities. It's both paid and unpaid for these waged women workers. Um, it's privatized under capitalism. So whether it's waged or unwaged, it's privatized under capitalism since it is owned by the male head of household. So we're talking about 1898 where women did not have the legal right to their wages. So they could go to the silk mills in 1920, but didn't have the right to, um, to own their own waged work. Women face pressures from organized working class men to refuse work, waged work. So one of the arguments she's making in this speech is women aren't strike breakers. Capitalists are seeking to lower the threshold, lower the floor of wages. So yes, they are paying women less, but that doesn't make women um, uh, the detriment to when men's wages. It only reveals the goal of capitalists, which is to have the wages be as rock bottom as possible. So that debate, this may have been one of the trickiest, one of the most heated parts of the debate um, in this period. Um, and in unions, in this whole period was, how do we perceive women workers when we know they are getting paid roughly half or 60% of what men are doing for the, the same kind of work. So that question of how do socialists, how do revolutionary movements, how do unions address the fact that women don't get paid wages equal to men? And the argument that Zetkin and other of her comrades were, were making at this is we, we bring women into this larger working class whole and we demand the equal wages, all wages must rise. 
rather than have women hold down the floor, the absolute rock bottom of wages, we must demand that all wages are equal and only in that way can we raise have the potential to demand better wages. And what she also brought up is that women are often excluded from labor organizations. And she said, this has to stop. And this could be labor organizations, this could be left parties. This was something where she said, we cannot have a segregated membership. We cannot have sex segregated membership. Okay. So her, given that these critiques were part of what she explores in this speech, her answers are probably pretty obvious. Women should join the proletariat as workers with full access to equal wages and economic rights. Only then can they fully inhabit the public sphere as people with civil and social rights. Marxist movements should also support the universal franchise for all people, so the universal right to vote for everyone. Women should be encouraged to join collective workers' organizations like unions. And the issues of women's unpaid reproductive labor should be addressed by a socialist collectivist society. Only when women join the proletariat class movements can workers of the world unite. So um, we'll, get, we'll look at that last question a little bit more as we go on. But this, um, this specificity, this particularity of women's work, that unpaid work of the home, that reproductive labor, is a real sticking point. It's a problem, right? And so if we go back to that question of why aren't women joining these um, unions or socialist movements, if women are the ones taking care of the young people after they get off their shift or making the meals or washing the clothes or cleaning the house or all of these things, where is the time to join a meeting outside of work. Okay. So this last point, um, how to make life revolutionary, moves past the, to after the formation of the USSR, and Alexander Kolontai asked the question, why aren't women at the center and in the leadership of revolutionary life and governments? And her answer was one that sought to alleviate this, this double or triple burden. Working class and peasant women's workloads are doubled and tripled over men's workloads since they include waged work and craft labor. They include daily reproductive labor um, and generational reproductive labor. So, so quite literally the making of people. Um, okay. So in her speech, the social basis of the woman's question she argued, like Engels, abolish the family. Um, she, additionally, she argued abolish marriage, and this is before the successful um, Russian Revolution of, of 1917. This is in 1909. And once that, um, once 1970, once the USSR was established, Kolontai put these theories, these um, demands into practice um, alongside her comrades. So abolish marriage, give women access to the means of production, transform act effective um, economic relations, um, and collectivize daily reproductive labor, including emotional labor, um, which she wrote about in a lot of her pieces, and de destigmatize sex and women's sexual desire. So these were some of her answers that she was developing and sought to include in the formation of the USSR after 1917. All right, so as we go over this, how to build a unified working class movement for socialism. To build a working class movement, we must understand how capitalism works. The relations of reproduction and the relations of production are the central mechanics, uh, mechanics of capitalism as a system. So the capitalism as a system requires um, surplus value to function and yet surplus value, that, that value extracted from workers' labor, that paid work, which is far smaller than the amount of the, the value that accrues when, when workers um, work, um, that is where surplus value comes from, but the reproduction of workers is unpaid, is unwaged. 
Um, and that's what we mean by the relations of reproduction. And here's where Rosa Luxemburg has, um, has written a lot as well. Once we understand these relations of capitalism, we can see how capitalism functions and how it reproduces itself. Even through the crises, even through the contradictions, our ability as, um, as Marxist thinkers is absolutely critical to understanding that. And once we understand how capitalism reproduces itself, we can better understand its weaknesses and its contradictions in a specific context. Once we see its weaknesses and contradictions, we can fight to transform it. So I'm gonna take a breath and I'm gonna take a drink of water and then we'll keep going. All right. So um, the other piece of this talk is looking at the context of the United States and the context of theorists who were part of the, um, the Communist Party, USA, but also part of the um, Popular Front movements. Um, and this is a picture of Louise Thompson Patterson, um, and she's reading the paper. And if you can read the title, it's got Robeson in concert, Wrigley Field on Friday Eve. And I've chosen a quote here um, from an article that uh, Louise Thompson Patterson wrote in 1936 called Toward a Brighter Dawn. Um, Over the whole land, Negro women meet this triple exploitation as workers, as women, as Negroes. So the, the term that she's using is one from her period. Um, it's not the term I'm using myself. I'm using black women. Um, but her argument here is one that has um, had a huge influence. So this is 1936 and continues to influence parts of um, working class women's movements, but also feminist movements. So I thought what we could do is look at this history, this legacy that we have in the United States to start developing our analysis of working class women's issues before our own discussion. So I have put in this slideshow, um, uh, which I, I think you'll have access to potentially, um, Louise Thompson Patterson talking about mass organizing to free the Scottsboro defendants. So this was a, an absolutely pivotal struggle. It was around the um, false accusation of rape against um, several, seven uh, young black men. Um, some of them weren't men, they were under 16. Um, and they were accused of rape by two white women. Um, and their, um, both their jailing and their, their almost murder at the hands of an angry white mob was um, narrowly averted. Um, Louise Thompson Patterson, as well as the Communist Party at large and the larger Popular Front movement sought to build and did build a, an international movement to demand the release of these young men. Um, and she talks about how the, the techniques of mass organizing within the Communist Party in particular and the building of these popular front movements was so effective um, and, and showed the unwillingness, the refusal of white, black, Latino, Mexican American, of all of the people, Asian American, the refusal of people, not only in the United States, but the refusal of people around the world to allow for a lack of basic justice for Black Americans. Um, and that solidarity and that legacy of organizing the, the greatest mass of peoples was part of the legacy of her own activism. So as we men I mentioned earlier, we come from a tradition of praxis. So theories are not abstract. They don't live simply um, on the basis of logic they are honed and developed through struggle. So as we look at this category, when she looks at workers, women, and black people, that this concept of triple exploitation, the complexity of exploitation was how she was articulating it, how she was saying it in 1936. So, Claudia Jones was someone who learned from Louise Thompson Patterson, who organized with her in Harlem. 
1949, she developed this idea. And, and you know, I'm choosing written a written record of these ideas. What I would argue is the theories of, of the Communist parties, um, certainly the Communist Party in the United States, our theories come from practice. So the idea, the sort of bourgeois practice of, of hooking an idea or 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 gifting or, or owning an idea by one person is not how we develop our praxis. It's not how we develop our ideas. We develop them through struggle. So uh, Claudia Jones wrote this article and these are her words and I think it's important for us to celebrate that but also to know that these are concepts that are built among the masses, among the many. So she says here, only to the extent that we fight all chauvinist expressions and actions as regards the Negro people and fight for the full equality of the Negro people, can women as a whole advance their struggle for equal rights. For the progressive women's movement, the Negro woman who combines in her status the worker, the Negro, and the woman is the vital link to this heightened political consciousness. So here again, we can, we can see that articulation of a theory that we are fully within today. We are fully a part of in our thinking in the, in the CPUSA. Um, that there isn't a possibility of, of building a unified movement without a class analysis of racism, without a class analysis of the woman question of women's rights, right? And of sexism and male supremacy. So without understanding the conditions of black women without understanding the location, the systemic location of black women in the United States, um, we will miss the capacity to build that mass movement. So this article was published in 1949, um, but like all good ideas and like all ideas built in struggle among the many, even the, the, the crush of the Cold War, the crush of the McCarthy period that sought for us probably not to read this article today um, and to make sure that it didn't get disseminated through the McCarthy trials, these ideas live on today. They're just too good to leave behind. Um, so here's a campaign that was part of, it started in 1948. Um, and it continued until 1959, until Rosalie Ingram and her two sons were released from jail. Um, and here is an argument around sexual assault, around rape, that demands we think through, again, the specific place and time, how capitalism is functioning in the United States. So we're talking about 1948, these legacies, of um, systemic racism, of uh, systemic sexism is ongoing. Um, and this campaign, again, like the Scottsboro campaign, um, this was an international, a transnational campaign um, to free Mrs. Rosalie Ingram. Um, and what, uh, what Claudia Jones and others sought to demand is that we look also at male supremacy. Um, and that when, when male supremacy meets a white supremacy, uh, uh, systemic racism, these, um, these exploitations and the use of rape as a tool of terror um, is, is um, absolutely unavoidable to the struggle. So in this particular struggle, Rosalie Ingram, who is a sharecropping, a woman who sharecrops, so she didn't own the land that she worked on, um, in Georgia. Next door was a white man who also was a sharecropper. And what came out in the trial is that he was sexually assaulting her and sexually harassing her continually. And so when he was killed by her sons, after he assaulted her, after he hit her, um, the, when her two sons stepped in and killed him. And as the trial went forward, um, what was revealed was the, the complexity of brutality that this black family living under the conditions of sharecropping in Georgia in the 1940s um, that they were living under and, and what, what was endemic to the region and to the industry. 
So I'm going to end this section and then we'll start moving into, so keep thinking about what are working class women's issues today. Um, but as we think about this category, this complexity, this tradition that we come out of as um, communists, um, I wanted to look, we have a photograph here a little bit after this quote was written. So it was published in 1984 in an international publisher's um, uh, piece. Uh, it's called Angela Davis and um, Henry Winston from 1976. And the quotation was, um, working class and racially oppressed women confront sexist, uh, Working class and racially oppressed women confront sexist oppression in a way that reflects the real and complex objective interconnections between class exploitation, racist oppression, and male supremacy. Whereas a white middle-class woman's experience of sexism incorporates a relatively isolated form of this oppression, working class women's experiences necessarily place sexism in its context of class exploitation. And Black women's experiences further incorporate the social factor of racism. These are by no means subjective experiences. Rather, there is an objective interrelationship between racism and sexism in that the general context of both forms of oppression in our time is the class struggle unfolding between monopoly capitalism and the working class. So this is a hard quotation, um, and it comes out of an essay that is the foreword to Clara Zetkin. Um, it's at a time when her more popularly written book, Women, Race, and Class, was published. And what I see in this quotation is she's really talking to her comrades on the left in this quotation. That, subtlety of her analysis um, is why I chose it for this class today. And um, just, let's see. So the picture, you can see Henry Winston sitting down. This is um, a picture from uh, the Communist Party offices in New York City. All right. So I wanted to make sure that you had some of the books um, if you want to see more, let's see, I think there's one more here. Um, you may already know these, but there's Left of Karl Marx, um, Red Feminism by Kate Weigand, who has a really good section on um, the, this tradition within uh, the CPUSA. A new, a new book, Organized Fight Win, which is a collection of um, Black communist women's political writing. Um, a book by Dale Gore, Radicalism at the Crossroads and then Eric McDuffie's history, Sojourning for Feminism. So if you're interested, I wanted to make sure. And I remember things better if I can see the images, so I thought I'd give you the book covers as well. Okay, so we have a minute to breathe. Um, and what I'd like to do is um, have you look at what you've written down, See what you've been thinking about um, as I've been speaking. And um, I, what I'm hoping is that we can go pretty quickly with this. So I know that it's a little complicated opening and shutting the microphone, but if you can just, we're creating a list. What are working class women's struggles in the US today? And I'll, I'll open it up for for your ideas, and I will try to make sure to keep a list of everything. All right, uh, hi everyone, this is Molly again. I'm here to moderate the discussion. Um, as a reminder to indicate that you would like to contribute a question or comment to this discussion period, please uh, select the picture of the raise of the hand and you will raise your hand. Um, and then select the picture of the mic to open your mic. After that, I'm gonna call on your name and I'll open the mic on our end. So um, again, looking for raised hands, first step is to uh, click the icon of the hand and then the icon of the mic.
So Lisa, I am not seeing raised oh, hand. Interesting. So is this a difficulty in thinking about what women class, women working class women struggles? I, I do see raised hands. Uh, okay. You don't. Okay. Uh, this is D. I will assist. Brandy, your mic is open on our end. Please open the mic on your end. Brandy. Brandy, your hand is up. We open the mic on our end. Please just click the picture of the mic with your mouse cursor, and that will open the mic on your end. There you are. Thank you. Um, I always think of how until women have rights, full rights, that children will not, and that when children have full rights, women will have equal rights. I also notice in society in America that normal places you go don't have many children. And I live my life in Phoenix, Arizona. I don't know what it is, but you just rarely see pregnant women just out in the general public. I know this sounds strange, but can other people observe if this is true? And uh, what can we do to get uh, get the the spotlight on how important childcare is to freedom? Thank you. Okay, looking for looking for more raised hands. Molly, can you see anything now? Yes. Okay, I can see them now. Okay, Rosanna, your mic is open. Yes, um, my 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 thing is the um, how the challenge of how we can make how we can identify or help identify without getting angry, I guess, of how how male chauvinism male chauvinism is displayed in the struggle. Um, how do we help men identify that within themselves? You know, perhaps they don't feel that they're male chauvinism. You know, they don't have the same, uh, they're somewhat woke, I guess you would say, but uh, yet there are some, these subtleties that don't make women feel welcome in spaces, in meetings and things like that. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Drew, your mic is open. News hour. Hello, sorry, everybody. So I have um, this question more specifically about um, women's struggles, um, struggling to gain unity. For example, in Michigan, um, there is a Michigan Coalition for Reproductive Liberation. Um, they, t they, uh, you know, while they're fighting for the right to. Uh, free choice and abortion and access to um, contraception and education, um, they tend to not include all different struggles of women. For example, I'm a trans woman and um, sometimes it's hard to um, get through those splinters and how the chauvinism has um, and hate has spread and seeing that our struggles are one in the same, how a trans woman not having access to gender affirming health care is the same struggle as um, anybody who needs access to, you know, reproductive uh, health, you know, it's just all part. So I just, I guess my question is a larger, how do we get through those gaps of misunderstanding between on women, working women? Thank you, Drew. Ismael, your mic is open. Ismael, please open the mic on your end. There you go. Yes, um, I thought uh, the question on the screen had to be answered. So, of course, the right to vote, the right to abortion, equal pay, equal access to jobs, um, access to safe spaces, and access to education, I think, are some of the principal uh, women's uh, issues that are facing us today. 
Thank you. Keenan, your mic is open. Thank you, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so I guess just um, from my perspective as a single child or as a child with a single mother, um, I know one big issue, um, kind of like what Brandy mentioned, was services that kind of uh, facilitate basically allowing, I guess, pregnant women to function in society, um, child care resources, uh, all types of those things I think are um, significant working class struggles for women. And that's not to say that it's an expectation for women to be responsible for those things, but like when it comes to circumstances where women are thrust into those situations, they don't really have a lot of resources uh, available. And also that doesn't seem to be a priority from politicians and uh, other institutions of power. Thank you. Rebecca, your mic is open. Please open the mic on your end. There you go. Okay, hi. Um, uh, I just first want to say, you know, um, trans solidarity. So with the person earlier, um, I feel that, you know, I see that every day. So, but that's kind of just an aside. Um, but I think specifically working class women today, like you're working in the workforce, I've seen like this rise in the U.S. anyway with um, the traditional lifestyle making this resurgence. And I think it's interesting because with the capitalist system we live under and this push for traditionalism again, you have women that are working full time because they must and they're also still having like being pushed to take care of all the household labor, all the child rearing, all that the reproductive work. So I think it's, you know, in the days of like in the 1920s, it was more of like the women being home. I mean, there was still working class women then too, but I think even more today is an issue of um, the pressure of women being forced to work simultaneously and be the full-time mother and household leader, you know what I mean? So that's something that I feel like I see in the U.S. a lot. Thank you. Lowell, your mic is open. There you go. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I think a broader struggle for working class women today is just our view of working class women's labor as being sort of subpar to quote unquote male labor. And I give the examples of key domestic labor, hotel work, home health care, child care. I think we diminish, or we don't show that solidarity. And to um, so it's a struggle for women to Rosanna's point, I think, to piggyback off of it, men's chauvinism. Um, I wish that we had our bigger unions like the, the Teamsters and AFL-CIO would produce more of their muscle on behalf. And I know they do some work, that's true, but I wish they would do a lot more. And I think the lack of it is, um, the lack of that solidarity with those industries that are predominated by women's labor, I think is a form of chauvinism that hurts the uh, working class women's movement. Thank you, Lowell. Alan, your mic is open. Alan, please click. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, these are all good points, but a lot of the problem is with patriarchy, um, no supremacy, all this. You know, the far right is very anti woman, very patriarchal. They want to have the woman back in the kitchen out of the work. They want to have women out of society. And this is a big concern. You know, the far right has been a problem getting worse and worse. And, you know, this is just another thing that women have to fight. And men have to fight it too. As, you know, the whole, the whole working class has to fight this. Thank you, Alan. All right, we have two more, Lisa. Alexis, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end, okay? 
mic. Thank you, Molly. Uh, and thank you, Lisa, for the presentation. Uh, I think to answer your question in terms of some working class women's struggles, um, mental health resources and domestic violence care, those are the two things that kind of came to mind. I feel like, um, to kind of touch on something that someone said earlier, women are expected to kind of be the bearers of all uh, labor struggles, it feels like. Um, and I think that having that be the forefront of people's minds about how people can snap, women can snap under that kind of pressure um, would be a good thing. So yeah, that's my thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Lisa, was that hard for you to hear as well? Um, it was a little hard, but I, I, I managed to, I think I got it. Um, I yeah. heard um, mental health resources and domestic violence and that women are the bearers of all labor and under these conditions, women can snap, I think is what I heard. Yes. Okay. Just wanted you to know, Alexis, there's something wrong with the audio. Kazu, your mic is open. Uh, please open it on your, your end. Click the picture of the mic to open Kazu Bernstein. Kazu, your, there you go. Up, click the mic one more time. There. <laughs> just okay. Okay. Um, I think that right now, the question of not seeing so many pregnant women is now they work, and so they stay at work. Like uh, my daughter stayed at work until the very last day, so she could have more weeks to take care of her child um, because that they don't, we don't give uh, in most times women to stay home and bond with their children. I think uh, we need to begin, and we've talked about this many years, to start having daycare centers at places of women's work. I see on TV commercials for, you know, making the workers comfortable. Well, maybe now they can make part of that uh, a place to bring your child so that you can have lunch with them and what have you. And taking them home doesn't take so much time because the hours of bringing a child to daycare, picking them up, getting home, and the cooking and everything uh is tiring you know for anybody um i know uh there were times that once in a while i could have a comrade or somebody watch my son so i could go to a club meeting so guys can help in that way um and i think that uh this this Thing that's going on with these men who are taking away health care. They say it's about, uh, they don't want women to have abortions, but they don't realize, they think it's so simple, but they don't realize the amount of angst it causes, the amount of um, illness, death, um, and if we don't begin to get into that fight, I'm afraid uh, that a lot of the questions that we have and, you know, and Lisa, thank you f for the class. Um, it, I see that women as single women, well, I'm in senior housing, but I see we talk about our daughters and how afraid they are because if they get into trouble or if they have to go to Planned Parenthood for anything else, they will not be able to do that because they're closing all these centers. And I think that's something uh, that we could begin to really work on. That's it. Thank you. Uh, and we're out of time for those of you who still have your hand up. Uh, thanks for your participation. Um, go ahead, Lisa.
Sorry, Lisa, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. That was fantastic. So what we can hear that among working class women's struggles, they are complex. Um, these questions of healthcare, whether it's transgender affirming, um, affirming healthcare, whether it's women's um, bodily healthcare, reproductive healthcare, access to abortion, the capacity to decide, yes, I can have this child right now, I have the I have the resources to have this child has been taken away. Um, we have a concept, reproductive justice, that is a systemic look at what does it mean to, to have a child? Under what conditions does a woman choose, yes, I'm ready? So that the, the questions, the aspects of um, raising children and living your life as a single person, as a, as a person who is not married, um, we live in a, the United States is built for married couples. It's built for um, heterosexual married couples. And the way right to our tax systems, to our healthcare access, to how we have um, access to housing, to loans, these are subtly embedded in presumptions of how working class women should live. Um, I think I heard questions about being in the public space. So whether or not um, I think the answer that Kazi gave to why aren't there more pregnant women in the public sphere, um, that people are just, women are working up until the very last day. I can say that was true for me. Um, and then not having paid maternity leave, not having um, access to daycare, let alone paid daycare. So if we remember back in 1908 with Alexandra Kolontai, she said collectivize ch childcare, make sure that it's, it's free and safe and healthy and um, a place you want to bring your child before you go to work. Um, so all of these issues, that question of bodily autonomy that we hear about in reproductive justice movements, um, but also um, the capacity to be safe in public. So one of the ways to, to, to kind of hamper working class women's ability to move through the world um, is to make it an unsafe place to be, either due to the threat of physical violence, sexual violence, or just intimidation, right? So all of these issues, what we can hear, they're not identical to the locations in Turkey. I didn't hear anybody mention polygamy per se, um, like Nasiya Hanim, who we looked at in the, the Toilers of the East conference. But this question of what is a acceptable way to be in a relationship? What is an acceptable form of a marriage? What is an acceptable body to be in? If we ask about trans women's rights or genderqueer, um, people's rights. So, so these are absolutely connected. Um, those of us on the left as working class women, um, some working class women have maybe found that way not to work. We are at a moment in the, the US late capitalist economy, financial capitalist economy, that it is very hard to live without work. Whether or not you are in a married couple with a male breadwinner or a married couple with a same sex partner, it is very hard to live with only one wage. So that question that Clara Zetkin was raising in 1898, unless we organize everyone and we raise the floor of wages, we don't allow that differential between women's wages and men's wages, between a black worker's wages and a white worker's wages, or a black woman's wage and a white man's wage. Like all of these differentiations benefit the capitalists. These are the differentiations that decrease not only the wages, but our capacity to live, our capacity to thrive. So what I'm really appreciative is I heard in all of these, I kept notes and I will type them up and maybe we can find a way to share them. There were questions that were about being a working class woman or feminine presenting person. Um, but there were also questions within the movements, and one was in what we consider the women's movement around reproductive justice, reproductive rights, and a kind of trans-exclusionary politics that is developed, again, fighting against the unity that we seek. 
Um, the other is uh, sort of old attitudes, um, uh, sort of ongoing attitudes of male supremacy, who deserves to be in a leftist meeting, in a union, who deserves to speak, who deserves to be listened to. And these are old habits. Um, as with white supremacy, these are habits that it is not only incumbent upon those who are hurt by the behaviors of bigotry or of chauvinism, um, it is incumbent upon all of us to unlearn these patterns of behavior that erode and denigrate um, the masses of those of us fighting together. Um, I think there's a real um, complexity here, and I, I, I have not done full justice to all of the, the aspects. There was one, Mia, you mentioned something around safe spaces. I think this is another aspect, the question of endemic violence as a women's rights question, as a working class women's struggle. Um, what is it to be safe? We can hear the demand that would, would join together the largest number of, of working class people who want to live in, in a world that is not rent, not, not threaded through with violence, whether it's through gender identity or because you're a woman in public or because you're, a, um, uh, um, you're gay in public. Like these are, these are in the fabric of, of the world we live in or because you're black in public, right? So um, as we start thinking about working class women's struggles, even in the way we articulated them, some are specific to questions of women's work, that notion of women being the reproducers of children, the raisers of children, or the cookers of dinner, um, or getting folks to the healthcare. Others, that one around mental, mental health, raises that question of emotional labor and emotional capacity. What happens in capitalist society, the brutality of capitalist society, where is that mental repair, that emotional repair? Who's doing the labor of emotional repair after a 10 hour, 10 hour shift, right? And, and how is that also generated in subtle ways? So that also becomes women's work. And then that last piece is around the role of children. And I think I'm connecting now the point that um, Lowell that made that um, that view that working class women's labor is subpar. Um, that service work and care work, which are the paid industries that are predominantly um, hiring women and, you know, sort of peopled by women, um, are the, the wages are the lowest. Um, the questions of um, racism are, uh, and particularly the racism against women of color, are absolutely in the latest um, Department of Labor statistics. Um, so these are old problems that, that, that we still fight. We, are, we still seek unity through bringing them together. So um, a couple of the, the, so what we're raising are the issues and embedded in all of these comments um, that you've made, I think are really important aspects. Um, and what do we mean by sexism? What do we mean by male supremacy? And what do we mean by, by class struggle? So um, sexism, especially when combined with racism and xenophobia, um, that refusal to see the rights of um, either recent migrants or um, um, citizens who were not born in the United States or residents in the United States, whether or not they have um, um, legal papers, that refusal to um, join in the struggle um, with, uh, in building our movements. So sexism, when combined with racism and xenophobia, lowers the threshold of subsistence for all workers. Um, Black and Latino women are pay the lowest wages in the United States. Sexism and racism in the workplace combined degrades the working conditions for all workers. Sexism and racism create a culture, and I would here include in sexism, transsexism, a transphobia and create a culture of disrespect for work in fields, and this comes back to that point, Lowell, that you made, degrade, um, in fields that are majority people of color and women's jobs, such as domestic work and service work and agricultural work. Um, it it, it um, not only decreases the value of the labor, which is bad enough, given that we have learned during the pandemic, this is absolutely the essential work. 
who grows our food, who takes care of us, who um, makes sure that grocery stores are open, who makes sure that, that the basic functioning of our society, these, for a brief moment, we call these workers essential workers, but this older tradition of disrespect for these jobs, um, as soon as the pandemic was over, somehow we forgot, we didn't raise the wages, we didn't give the value in capitalism, which is, is, is through a higher wage, we didn't give a value to those essential workers. In fact, we sought, um, capitalists sought to make those jobs just as precarious as they were before the pandemic. So I think that question of value for work is absolutely critical. So sexism and male supremacy divide the working class from uniting towards common goals and shared ideas, ideals. And ideologies, and this came up as well, um, ideologies of male supremacy erode the ability of half the working class from joining political struggles, from gaining bodily autonomy, from protecting themselves from interpersonal violence, the capacity to live a safe life. Um, and from even that basic thing of rejuvenating themselves in their so-called time off from paid work, um, to sit down, to um, go for a walk, to read a book, to chat with a friend, those very basic parts of, of, of um, how we survive capitalism. Okay. So as we, I'm, we're heading, I know we're making sure of time, oh, we still have a little time. So uh, in organizing against sexism and male supremacy in capitalism, we have ongoing questions to strengthen the unity and the vanguard of working class struggle. So how can we now build the largest movement possible to dismantle sexism? And then another, again, hard question, but one that I could hear in a number of your answers. Um, what are the sharpest contradictions of sexist and male supremacist relations in capitalism at this moment, in this location? And who lives on the knife's edge of these contradictions? How can the unified working class movements center these struggles? So these are hard questions, um, but I think they're worth taking a minute to think about. Um, and if anyone has thoughts or responses to any of these, um, maybe we could take two or three and then, and then go back and forth. All right, sounds good. As a reminder, open the mic on your end. Uh, first, raise uh, your hand by clicking the hand icon, then click the mic icon, uh, and I will call on your name. David, your mic is open on our end. Uh, please open the mic on your end by clicking the mic icon. David, David, your mic is open. There you go. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, this is David. Um, um, I'm, both my parents are half Vietnamese and half Chinese. And but um, I guess in relation to these questions, I feel like um, part of the work is around propaganda and communication ways. Like I'm curious on how um, cis men can figure out how to better communicate when there may be some social political disagreements with um, marginalized genders, um, especially if there's different ideologies as well, uh, and how to go about that. I feel like that would be um, a good skill set, skill set to explore. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, D, are you seeing raised hands? Oh, okay, I'm seeing. Oh. We are still looking for raised hands. Um, if you'd like to contribute an answer to this question. Okay, Mosin, your mic is open on our end. There you go. Thank you. Now, I want to raise the question of the influence of culture in, in, in oppressing women. And that shows the trust in the in the in the, in the working class. Everywhere the, the women, all the religions, all cultures have, have this attitude to women. Women are inferior, 
with the world phase of communism, and here women can tolerate a lot of stuff that just dump it on them. And there is obviously these films we fall for, but it's not quite clear how do you fight them all the time. And, and you could run into all sorts of difficult problems in terms of alienating the, even the part of the working class. But they are also, they have absorbed a lot of this, this the traditionary traditions in the among them. If you address that a little bit, it's helpful. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mohsin. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands at the moment. Uh, so Lisa, okay. if you'd like to respond. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you, David, and thank you, Mohsin, for these comments. And it sounds to me like you're, I mean, these are good dialectical questions. How, how is it possible to build lines of communication, given that under capitalism, these segmentations and the kind of demand that the working class be split along differences either of gender identity, of, of nationality, of, um, of sex, of race, right? How do we build the trust so that we can have a difficult political conversation? I really appreciate that question. Um, and I think that like like most of what we do is 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 built through through our activism um so i don't know that i can and i imagine that this would be one of those skill sharing moment but what what allows for that level of trust to build so that one can communicate across a culture that is deeply transphobic and the politics of transphobia are getting more and more heightened so that so that there, there is um, a kind of active building that's necessary for communication, particularly difficult communication, like trying to figure out um, what's a political position or um, some of the questions in our movements. Um, and I really appreciate that. Also, um, Mohsin, you said um, that, and, and this is why I began um, with the conference um, in Baku, that this is a, a global problem. The question and within um, revolutionary and Marxist movements, this is something that's as old um, as, as, as our movements is asking, how can we dismantle the kind of um, assumptions of um, inferiority of women that somehow they're embedded in a kind of either a natural inferiority or a God-given inferiority. Um, and these are old presumptions. So someone spoke about the kind of rise of a neo-traditionalism so that there's a notion of, of, of what kind of family is correct or moral. These questions of, of God-given and nature-given, I think the question of, of, of Marxism is we make sure we always ground it, our, our answers in material realities. Um, we don't look to these kind of um, trans-historic uh, answers, whether through a kind of religious presumption of hierarchy between men and women, or um, that somehow it's built into nature itself, um, into the bodies or the genetics or the DNA. Um, as Marxists, we have to make the arguments um, that these are in fact historically produced. These are not um, outside of our capacity to change them. All right. So, um, Lisa, we have another hand if you'd like. Sure. Yes, I'll go back a slide. Rebecca, your mic is open. Uh, please open the mic on your end. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking like um I think in our current like society with like um the media helping to perpetuate these like culture war issues like I mean like when you hear about like specifically when you look at this, oh, I'm sorry when you look at things like the people talking about passing bill to make it illegal for trans women to compete in a swimming competition and it's like it's all distraction so i think one of the biggest ways that we could really um 
dismantle a lot of different bigotry, including sexism and racism, is to be able to look past the culture war BS that keeps getting thrown at us as like something else to rile up our feathers or, you know, to make one side upset at the other when it's really like two sides of the same coin on a lot of these things that they're talking about, even from MSNBC to Fox News. So I think if we can get away from that reactionary culture war 24 hour news cycle, that could help to open a lot of eyes. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And this is a, as you say, this is an old capitalist trick. We're not in competition. We are all part of the working class. We, we have combined interests. They are not the same. We don't have the exact same life histories or struggles that we face or locations as Angela Davis, I, I love that quote from Angela Davis, as she said, there's a complexity, there's a difference among us, but our, the vitality of our movement relies on us seeing we are not in competition with each other. We are part of a class struggle against the monopolists, against those who own the means of production and monopoly capitalism. And that, suggestion you have of looking past culture wars, it is in our own best interest to recognize a distraction when we see it. It's, it's absolutely true. Are there any other comments or thoughts? I don't see any. Okay. All right. So we're going to go back to Zetkin. Um, and I thought we could look again at the argument that she makes, and I, I kept this last part. Um, she's making an argument here that the liberation struggle of the proletarian woman cannot be similar to the struggle of the bourgeois woman. One of the distinctions, she argues, is that the bourgeois woman wages it against the male of her class because she's on the beneficiary side of capitalism she is looking for the right to access of wealth, the ownership of wealth, the ownership of property. What she argues for proletarian women, for working class women, is that unity in order to overcome the, uh, the exploitation of working class women, um, she must unite with men. And part of that struggle of making sure that these are men that fully see her value, fully see her worth, fully admit her into the political organizations of the day, that is the piece of this struggle. It's something that Clara Zetkin was very much aware of. And then she says at the very end, to be sure, she agrees with the demands of the bourgeois women's movement, what we tend in the left to call feminism, but she regards the fulfillment of these demands simply as a means rather than an end to enable that movement to enter the battle equipped with the same weapons alongside the proletariat. So here's an argument that she's making. And I think as we think in our current, so she's making this argument in 1898 around the franchise, around the vote. As we think about our current moment, I'd like to make an argument that as we go into feminist movements, yes, it's absolutely critical that we make those arguments for the basis of unity, that a kind of segmentation um, within what we call feminist movements is absolutely essential. I think as well, though, we have several trends that are also called feminism. And here I'm thinking of um, Cheryl, uh, what was her name? Cheryl Sandberg's lean-in feminism. So her argument was, don't complain about poor wages, don't complain about a lack of maternity care or, or or paternity care, don't complain about um, unsafe working conditions, instead lean in, work harder, and through overwork, somehow overcome these capitalist integral parts of working class life. The other one that I think about, and I'm using more hashtags, but within it is an, a, a presumption of another kind of feminism, maybe something commensurate to the bourgeois feminism that, that Zetkin is writing about, 
is a kind of girl boss feminism. And I started to think of these as almost a trickle down version of feminism. The idea that if we can break the glass ceiling, if women can enter the, um, become a president or become the owner of a billion dollar corporation, that somehow that will necessarily um, spread the rights for women to the working class women. This is an area that, that um, frankly, I don't agree with. Um, I think it's an, a level of individualism um, to feminism that, that, is, um, that is embedded in Zetkin's analysis as well. So what she says is proletariat working class women don't own, aren't seeking to own land. They don't have the, they don't even have access to owning the means of production. So those fights by the elite women in the feminist movement aren't her struggles. And yet there are still movement, bourgeois movement struggles, such as the struggle for the right to vote, which is important, is useful, is a tool, um, uh, um, uh, a tool for working class women's rights. And I think when we think about the struggles, when you named the struggles, these are these have many, many people in them. I think there's a way that rather than say feminism is always already not the movement we are part of, we have to enter those movements. We have to become part of those movements and make these arguments. Um, so I had asked about struggles and if, there's not much time, but if we have maybe one minute, or maybe this is something that we just think about, which feminist struggles today are also important to struggling, um, to supporting working class women's struggles? So if we ask about the reproductive rights movement, um, if we ask about trans rights movements, um, one of the questions I'd like us to think about, and I don't think we'll have time to talk about it in detail today since we end in three minutes, but something I think is worth us thinking about is these may not be the final tool that we need to build that, um, that revolutionary, um, those revolutionary goals that we seek, but are they integral to the struggle we're part of? So that access to the public sphere, access to childcare, access to full reproductive rights and healthcare rights and mental health rights, access to um, a equal relationships, whether they are same-sex relationships or um, uh, heterosexual relationships. How do we live in a world that is safe? Um, I would argue that many of the feminist struggles, what we call feminism today, are fighting for tools that that we too find useful, that a working class movement that seeks the greatest unity, we may have to make our arguments within those movements. In fact, we probably will. Make sure that when we ask the question of equal wages, it's never presumed that it's white women's wages that we are measuring. When we ask the question of xenophobia in the United States and the ways that um, we build a movement that refuses that xenophobia, these are arguments we make within the movement, but those tools, those goals are still ones that are absolutely vital to our struggles today. So I wanna say thank you to everyone for coming so well prepared with all of the issues um, and being willing to share them in the larger group. And um, thank you. And thanks to um, Dee and Molly for, for, for helping facilitate this today. Thank you, Comrade Lisa. All right, that closes our class for today. Uh, we will see you next time. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.